Iceberg Burner or what? Vanner. Iceberg um, and he'll be talking about um, phylogenetic reconstruction of complex traits. Um, and take it away when the bell rings. Sure. Yeah. I guess that's the bell, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, hello, I'm Kaiser Berger. Um, and what I'm going to do today is, um, well, is um, yeah, take you back 200 million years of bond evolution to show you how an ancient evolutionary innovation drove the origin of a complex trait, thereby enabling one of the world's most important nature problems. Now, as all of you know, I think one of the key questions of evolutionary biology has always been how complex not the traits or complex organs can actually evolve. For instance, a virtual eye, or a wing, or an interesting flower, or indeed a behavioral trait, like in this social lifestyle. And the origin of, the comp of a complex trait is so difficult because for the complex trait to work, you need not a single simple adaptation, but you need a whole range of subsequent steps that change the regulatory genes to follow this. Now, to the left here, we see a symbiotic root notion, and to the right, we see a few of them on the plant root. And they may not look complicated compared to an eye or a wing, but I would argue that this root object is a complex plant. For those of you who do not know this mutualism very well, in those root nodules, symbiotic bacteria live, and the plant provides the nodule and uh, the bacteria with carbon, and in return, the bacteria with nitrogen. And not only does this mutualism contain some agricultural important species, such as legumes, but it can also be responsible for over half of the nitrogen fixed in the ecosystem and is key for growing nutrient cycles. And despite its simple look, the nodule is actually quite complex because there is different zones with bacteria and different stages of appreciation, uh, signaling steps keep pathogens out, there are specialized tissue layers that exclude oxygen and transport nutrients back and forth. And all of that complexity is probably one of the reasons why despite the potentially enormous benefit of <coughs> being liberated from soil nitrogen limitations, mutualism is in fact quite rare. And by rare, I mean rare from the taxonomic perspective. Across the whole of the diversity of plant life, which you see here, it's found only in those four orders marked with a red box. And even within those orders, you have complicated distribution that is found in those clays marked with arrows at the bottom. And within those clays, in turn, there's variation, sometimes even within the genes. And that has led to all forms of informal hypotheses about uh, the evolutionary history of this trait, for instance, one here represented by those letters and notes. But one of the main questions has always been, do all these contemporary <coughs> cases of symbiotic nitrogen fixation share one underlying evolutionary innovation, or did they evolve through independently? And in the first case, there would essentially be a single evolutionary trajectory Whereas in the second case, there would be multiple, so to say, recipes to form this complex plant. But um, so far, uh, the most competing models have ultimately been verbal arguments, and there have been no formal reconstruction of the nature of the plant. So that's why I decided to create one, because nowadays, of course, we can all provide quantitative phylogenetic reconstruction of these types of things, and essentially try to find out if there's a single And in order to do that, I needed three things. And the first two are shown here on the slide. First, I created the world's largest and most comprehensive database of global nodule human species, containing almost 10,000 species in total, and I've made that available in the triad. And second, I used the, the, the most the largest and the most current phylogeny of global lung plants, containing more than 30,000 species in total. And when we combine these, we get this plot. Here we see the fixing species in green, and the normal fixing species in red. Now, this is already quite interesting, but what we really want to know is what happened to those back branches, what historical key events drove this disparate distribution. <coughs> in order to find that out, we need a third element, the suitable reconstruction method. Because the problem with traditional methods of reconstruction, of reconstructing a binary trait, is that they typically assume a single rate of gain and a single rate of loss all over the phylogeny. But when you study a complex trait 
uh, over a given time, like you know, between 20, 20 years ago, and of course thousands of species, a single speed of evolution is actually quite unlikely. So that's why we use this new method called hidden break models, where uh, you can, um, uh, which, which can allow, allows for multiple speeds of evolution. For instance, here schematically, a very high speed of uh, evolution, or high rate of evolution is at the bottom, and a, a much lower rate at the top of the matrix. And when we apply these methods to our data and to the phylogeny, we find that indeed a single speed model provides a very bad fit, and that confirms that there's multiple speeds, there were multiple speeds of evolution in the history of some of the extinction. But we also find that, importantly, that by far our best model is a model with two rates. Now, what does that mean and what does it tell us? This figure may look somewhat confusing, but this is a schematic representation of that, that model, and I will walk you through it. The two columns uh, represent the non-fixing phenotype on the bottom to the left and the fixing phenotype to the right. And what we see is that when we start at the ancestral state, the blue square on the top left, that you cannot immediately evolve symbiotic nitrogen fixation because this rate is zero. Instead, what you need to do is first switch to the second rate loss, represented by the bottom row, and make this very rare transition from blue to red before you can make the transition to the right column and actually evolve modulation. And because you need to make this transition through another non fixing state before it, where you can evolve the actual trait, we have called that the precursor. And um, some species that evolve to really nitrogen nice fixation can subsequently take the second, the second step and move from the green uh, square to the purple state. And both of these are capable of forming nodules, but the main difference is that in the green state, the mutualism is very easily lost, whereas in the purple state, it's almost impossible to do. Now, yeah, what does this somewhat abstract figure tell us when and where did this happen? In order to find that out, we plotted those states back into phylogeny, because we want to find <coughs> where the speed and most importantly, we found the origin of the precursor here at the base of the nitrogen fixing plate over 100 million years ago. And you see that only after that evolved um, can we, can we see, do we observe the transition from red to green as the evolution of actual nitrogen fixation. And we think, therefore, that this uh, precursor state uh, represents a cryptic genetic innovation long time ago, and didn't directly produce nodules in those plants, but allowed for their evolution, sometimes dozens of millions of years later. And that, in turn, would mean that all these contemporary instances of symbiotic nitrogen fixation are what is sometimes called depositors to share the same underlying, underlying evolutionary mutation. And when we calculate the number of transitions between our uh, states, we see that indeed the evolution of the precursor was a signal event. It happens only once and without this uh, modulation of mutual membrane that happens. And this in contrast to unique evolution of the actual fixing phenotype, which uh, happens only a few times. What we also see is that the precursor was not necessarily a very stable trait. It was lost quite a lot of times, and that means that many descendant species that are currently living are no longer predisposed towards forming this symbiotic stability. Now, if we look at the uh, stable fixing state, the purple state that I talked about earlier, we see that across our entire phylogeny that was lost, uh, uh, that wasn't lost a single time, and that essentially means that in those plants, the mutualism was so ingrained that there's nothing lost, not, not lost wasn't developed in evolutionary time. And we think that in that use, this may be driven partially by the evolution of a high nutrient lifestyle, which is shown here by a positive phylogenetically correct correlation between plant nitrogen content on the y-axis and increasing mutualism stability uh, on the, or mutualism resistance on the x-axis. And this high nitrogen lifestyle may have given lots of benefits to those plants, but they, uh, it would also have increased um, the relative cost for those plants of abandoning the mutualism because yeah, then you really need your symbionts to provide you with all that nitrogen, thereby essentially locking those plants into a symbiotic lifestyle and increasing mutualism. So, we can summarize the evolutionary trajectory that we see in the evolution of symbiotic nitrogen extension. First, we get a single precursor, then we get about eight origins of symbiotic nitrogen fixation, and then 
this data to potentially use some information for it. And that raises the question of course, well, what was that key, crucial, recursive step biologically? And unfortunately, I can't tell you because nobody really knows yet. But I think here too, our reconstructions can help because remember that some of those um, um, that recursive trait was actually lost in about 17 times. So that means that not all these species that didn't have them anymore. And if we look at the distribution of currently living species that are still predicted to still retain the precursor, and I've uh, labeled some of them with stars here, we see that they're phylogenetically quite dispersed in this population. And that is good news because it means that they're separated by dozens or hundreds of millions of years of evolution. It means that they probably share very little else other than that underlying precursor uh, uh, traits. And that means that a good way, of, or potentially a good way of finding uh, what the precursor is biologically, is studying those taxonomically dispersed species in a comparative framework, rather than as the field has mostly been doing so far, focus on a few wall species that all, uh, like when Carver and Soy made it all found in the top of the biology purple bit. Um, and essentially, we're looking for something which is shared by all those taxonomically precursor species, but it's missing in sometimes quite closely related species where the precursor was lost. And of course, knowing what genes to look in does not, uh, what species to look in does not yet tell us what genes to look for. So I'm now working with a uh, international consortium of research groups to sequence some of those precursor and non-precursor species and using phylogenomics, hopefully map some potentially interesting genes and gene families onto the evolutionary reconstruction. So in summary, I have identified key events in the evolution of symbolic nitrogen fixation, specifically the crucial symbol precursor. I found novel states of the mutualism that you can't find without uh, taking a phylogenetic perspective, uh, for instance, the state of fixers. And I've identified current living precursor species, which, which I argue are pretty uh, in finding the actual biological form of the precursor. And more in general, I think this shows how advanced trait reconstruction methods are, are useful and perhaps even crucial when you are studying the evolution of complex traits uh, like this. Because if you would have stick with a single speed model of evolution, you would have never found the precursor or be able to study its, uh, its, its current distribution and its evolutionary history since. So that's perfect, because with that I would like to thank some people and institutions that helped me with this work and 